everything works out for me in the end. A lot of people, especially a lot of newcomers to the manifestation community, take this phrase to mean that only positive things should happen to me, right? And then they get upset when something goes wrong in the 3D or their circumstance is not improving as fast as they expected it to or they get an unexpected setback. When that unfortunate thing happens, it throws them off because it's like, wait a minute, but Neville Goddard, the manifestation community, told me that everything is supposed to work out in my favor, so why why is it not? Why are only bad things happening to me? Only good things and only lucky things are supposed to happen to me. The problem is that that's not the actual meaning of everything works out in my favor. You might not like what I'm about to say, but actually it's heavily dependent on you. You need to take a very active part in rewiring your subconscious. So it's not that the universe just owes you like positive experiences only. Your desire is supposed to fall into your lap. That is not what the phrase means. The phrase is, think of it as an invitation. It's an invocation for you to be the alchemist in your own life and to take whatever the 3D throws at you and turn it into gold, okay? Turn it into something in your favor. So everything works out for me in the end is completely dependent on you and your willingness and your effort in terms of rewiring your own brain, overcoming, reworking your tendencies up until now to default into victim mode, basically. Anytime life throws something that you perceive to be like unfair or harsh or yeah, just any difficult situation that life throws at you, it requires a lot of action on your part. So that might be the part that a lot of you might not like to hear. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. In the initial stage of rewiring your brain, that is the most tumultuous part, right? That's the part where you're going to, that's the time period where you are going to battle with yourself the most. And you are going to, I mean, it takes a lot of energetic work to reprogram your mind because your ego is very attached to your old way of thinking about things, basically your victim mindset. Let me give a few concrete examples. Like for example, I used to be very triggered when I was in my early to mid twenties. I thought the world was out to get me. I bought into all of the victim mentality uh, tropes that they pushed on our generation, right? Like racial, gender-based, I'm an Asian female, people don't respect us in this society. If a man told me to smile, I would take that as an insult. Right? If someone told me I was pretty, I would be like, oh, how dare you like hit on me on the street. I was one of those. That mentality bleeds into every aspect of your life. So if you're the type of person that walks through life thinking that you're a victim of circumstances or of other people, you think it feels good in the moment. Like to your ego, it feels good. Nothing is your fault, right? It feels good to blame someone else or to blame the situation or to throw your hands up and say that, well, fate just always deals me like a bad stroke of luck. I can't catch a break. And that's not my fault, right? That feels good to your ego because your ego is part of many mechanisms that are designed to try to keep you safe. Um, and safe to the human subconscious means the status quo, whatever you're already used to. Even if you're unhappy, if you are used to being upset triggered, feeling like a victim all the time, that's the state that your primal mind is going to try to keep you at, to keep you safe, because that's a survival mechanism running underneath all of our subconscious. Manifestation is the portal that gives us agency, okay? That gives us a way to take the power back. If you can manage to override your ego or like get rid of your ego, and if you can manage to weather that tumultuous period of time where you are actually like in the trenches rewiring your victim mentality tendencies, you know, your negative thoughts, your addiction to suffering. If you can just have faith, faith is also a big component that is required to embark on this journey. The way that I like to think about it is I'm a fan of the movie The Matrix, The Matrix Trilogy. It's one of my favorite movies. I know it's been hijacked by like the insult with the black pill community, whatever, like the manosphere. That doesn't matter to me. Like I still, it's still one of my favorite movies just because they hijacked it doesn't mean that it's meaning to me is diluted or warped. So to me, 
you know, one of the iconic scenes in the Matrix. I guess they're like in the simulation and then Morpheus is telling Neo to jump over, jump from one building to another, right? Like very tall skyscrapers and the, the space in between is like very vast. So Neo being someone who thought he was like a human in the real world bound by gravity for most of his life, that's like incomprehensible to his brain, right? That he would be able to just jump and safely land on the other side, on the other building. You have to let it all go, Neo. Fear, doubt, and disbelief. Free your mind. Whoa. But, you know, this is part of his training, right? To overcome, like, the illusion that is the Matrix. And so he does it, and... We, we have all like the special effects at the time it was really really a big deal it was like really the best special effects that had ever been done in cinema history for my mind. But what if he makes it ones have made the first jump i don't know how to describe it like the bending of the way that they um showed reality bending or like maybe he fell down but then he the instead of like crashing to the ground in a bloody mess he the ground like went down with him and then he went back up and then was able to safely land on the other side, right? Anyway, that leap that you have to take, that leap of faith that you have to take, Neo having to do that between these two like really tall buildings that are so far apart, his decision to just, you know, to go for it, right? Even though it might result in him meeting a bloody demise, that is the scariest part because you don't know, there's no proof, right? That you're gonna end up on the other side. But if you can, if you can get yourself to take that leap of faith, there's no going back from there. The analogy that I'm trying to make is that like, I think a lot of people, what prevents them from actually just going for it to rewire their mentality or their identity is that they feel there's a fear that, okay, but what if it doesn't work, right? Then I'm going to have egg on my face. At the very least, you just feel like, okay, well, I wasted all that energy for nothing. But usually it's not just that. Usually people, they're afraid of this like fake threat of embarrassment, public embarrassment that would come from like, okay, so I gave this crazy manifestation thing uh, a try and then it didn't work and now I'm the laughing stock. That's your primal pre-programmed fear that we all have inside of us that is part of our survival mechanism to keep us alive. But if you really think about it, there is no audience, okay? There's no crowd at the Apollo Theater waiting to boo you if something goes wrong, if it doesn't work, which by the way, like it always works. Manifestation always works. If you if you continue to persist, it's gonna work. You're gonna see results in your life. That's just like a law of the universe. All of this is happening within the confines of your mind. You don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to show anybody what you're journaling down. You can write or imagine or say to yourself any crazy thing you want in the privacy of your own mind. That's the beauty of the manifestation journey, right? Now, if you want to share it, of course, like some people, it actually uh, helps them if they document it or if they bounce ideas off of friends. But if you're one of those people that you feel like it's hard for you to even get started, to even take that leap of faith, just remember that nobody has to know. Even after your desire manifests into your life, the world still doesn't have to know if you don't want it to. You can write it down in your own notebook. You don't have to show it to anyone. You can rip the paper up later. You d can decide not to write it down and like only think about it in your head. You can desire the stupidest thing, like whatever judgment or ridicule that you're imagining this fake audience to have towards you. They can't have it if they don't know what your desire is, right? And you're not obligated to say it out loud to anyone. So you can imagine the most ridiculous thing in your mind, something that would be totally embarrassing that you wouldn't want to say to your family or friends. And guess what? You can keep it to, all to yourself. Because the last time I checked, there's no such thing as the thought police. I think that's the term from 1984 by George Orwell. Thought crime. Yeah, thought police. In 1984, they weren't allowed to think certain things. It wasn't even like a halt on the freedom of speech. It was a halt on what you could think in your mind. So last time I checked, we are not in 1984 yet, okay? Who knows? I mean, <laughs> there might be some form of that in the future, but honestly, can I give you my honest opinion? I have so much faith in humanity and human consciousness. Let's say like, even if the worst case scenario happened, somehow they found a way to monitor our thoughts so that we couldn't even think what we wanted to, like we couldn't even think with the freedom of our own minds. I believe that humans would still 
find some way to evolve to get around that. So like, let's say they developed some sort of program or like robots that were able to scan your mind so that you and, you know, you could be punished for thinking a certain thought against the government or whatever. Um, I believe that human consciousness, ooh, I just spilled my drink. I believe that we are so unlimited that somehow we would find a way to adapt. Somehow our brains would find a way to compartmentalize or like, you know, section off what it's able to show to the robot and what it's able to hide for ourselves. So I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Oh my God. I, this is the third thing I spilled today. I spill a lot of things actually in my apartment. Part of it, I mean, the, the practical explanation for it is that, yeah, my apartment is kind of, you know, it's small. I mean, it's normal for... A single person living in tokyo it's really nice i like the i like the quality because this building is new i am the first tenant in this building so no one's lived here before me so it, it was brand new all the facilities are very clean but yeah it would be nice if i had like at least one more room but i don't so that's the practical explanation for why i spill things also because like i have too much stuff and i need to declutter but uh i also think that the spirits are trying to tell me something <laughs> you're gonna think i'm crazy but i think that like every time i spill something it never gets on anything too valuable like it always gets on stuff that is just junk that's been lying around that i never i don't necessarily felt the need to throw it out because for example it could be a perfectly good pen or highlighter but maybe i've had it for like the past 10 years and it's from an old hotel that, you know, it's like not a pretty pen. It has no positive vibration to it. And so I feel like the spirit, like whenever I spill my hot sauce or something, and it happens to be on like an old pen or an old shirt that I never wear, it's like forcing me to declutter and get rid of those items that are only weighing me down. Maybe I think too much, but like, this is what I'm saying, okay? Everything works out in my favor. Actually, this is a prime example. So, like, most people, you know, when they spill something, it's like, oh my god, such a mess, like, I have to clean it up. Your mind automatically goes to that negative space, right? And then, like, even, you know, if it gets on some of your items, the default response that many of us have been programmed is to think that, oh my god, you know, I can't believe, like, I have to throw this out now. It's a perfectly good pen or, like, whatever, a book, right? Like, an old notebook that you spilled your juice on, so now it's gonna, it's, like, messed up forever. Even if it dries down it's still it's going to be messed up it's never going to return to its original form but like what if you took that as oh now i get to declutter this notebook without feeling unnecessary guilt about it because you know i spilled my drink so can't cry over spilled milk so now i have no choice but to get rid of it because what am i going to do with a wrinkly notebook and so boom your room is now that much less cluttered okay this is everything works out in my favor also, like these examples are so mundane and everyday, but the thing is, I feel like I try to give very specific examples because I feel like there are so many coaches out there, they give very generic examples. It doesn't, it's not potent anymore, you know? Whenever something becomes popular, like for example, um, affirmations, right? I feel like affirmations, I mean, it's always going to be a staple technique of manifestation, but I feel like there was one, there was a period where everyone was talking about affirmations. In the beginning, when people first discovered the power of, aff of affirmations, it was very potent because that we discovered that, oh, you know, thoughts become things. Your thoughts can literally dictate uh, how your physical reality turns out. And so like in that time period, when it was still relatively new, when people were discovering it for the first time, that was when it was most potent. But then later on, it got very saturated. I don't want to say oversaturated, I don't feel like it's completely accurate to say that the manifestation community is oversaturated because I believe that like human consciousness is already is always expanding just like the physical universe is always expanding and so there's no way for like something that's always expanding and growing more unto itself to become diluted if that makes sense. I don't know I'm getting a little too metaphysical now but uh yeah so at first it was like this niche thing that like only a select few people in the manifestation community, like the OGs were talking about. But then once it became mainstream, like it was great because more people were able to utilize it in their lives. But then the message or like the efficacy of manifestations kind of got diluted, uh, diluted. I mean, that's a cycle that happens with all types of trends in the world, not just with manifestation, but just in general, like fashion trends food trends. Tokyo in particular is notorious for lots of trendy cafes like popping up and 
you'll see the first few months there's a line all the way down the block every day you can't get a seat but then a year later it's closed down because the hype has died down right so you know that's why like you gotta it's a lifestyle right it's not like you're gonna do 10 manifestations for six months straight and your life is gonna be perfect smooth sailing on the up and up from now on no it's a lifestyle like you have to maintain this for the rest of your life your manifestation is like you're either in it or you're not okay you cannot be you're in it for life or you're not which is also a lot of a law of the universe it's the law that the only thing constant is change itself by that definition change is normal change is the normal state of things so if you're static or stuck somewhere you think that oh okay well i'm just staying in the same place but you're actually moving backwards because you're supposed to be changing and moving forward that's the actual that's the natural state of things like planets are constantly spinning and moving and the universe is you know moving apart so if everything was still that means that there's something holding it in place it's not just like still because it's floating there because that's float floating in the same place is not the natural state of things changing continuously rotating continuously expanding that's the natural state uh if you like in the past if i ordered something online and the place gave me the wrong item i would get triggered right i think the the basic reaction to that would be like oh my god so annoyed maybe i'll go curse out customer service or i'll write them like a really nasty email but no everything works out in my favor remember if i wanted to right like you have to have an i'm gonna get mine mindset with anything in life one of the big things that holds women in particular back is the good girl programming right because some part of you thinks that it's wrong or it's taking advantage you're doing something wrong by having that approach to a situation that you're used to reacting in a negative way to for example right if you receive the wrong item different from what you ordered you might feel that okay i need to teach this company a lesson i need to write their customer service a strongly worded email like how dare they get my order wrong i was supposed to have this in time for such and such event and now you know now everything's ruined because i got the wrong item what if you decided to react in the complete opposite way what if you asked yourself how can i use this initially knee-jerk reaction annoying situation what if you asked yourself how can i use this to my advantage well you could be unbothered first of all because like the item already came to your house right so you can't control what you can't control you're not the owner of that company you're not the person that packed your order so you can't control what already happened right then and there you can stop being irritated about it because it's already in the past you could actually be nice to customer service you could write a very nice very polite very empathetic email you could say to them very calmly that oh i ordered this item but a different one arrived in my mailbox can you please ship out the correct item to me thank you so much and in the beginning my advice is to overdo it right if you feel like you're overdoing it if you feel like okay this is laying it on a little bit thick you're not okay because you're not used to operating in this way so it feels like too much to you but it's actually just the right amount right so be as polite as possible be as cheerful as possible say thank you one or two more times than you're normally used to and then you know what happens? They're going to send you the item that you ordered and they're going to let you keep the mistaken item that they sent you in the first place. So now you have two items for the price of one. And their customer service also loves you now. You don't understand how much free stuff I've gotten just with this technique. It's not even a technique. Like I, It's not like I went out to with the intention of getting free stuff from a company. This happened to me um, so many times with Odin's Eye in particular. I know, so random. Odin's Eye, for some reason, they always send me like... The wrong palette or back when they did their shimmery like their duochrome singles collection they sent me like two of the same shade it was supposed to be like one through 30 and they sent me two of 20 or something but then 21 was missing so like that happened all the time and then even when they sent me replacements sometimes the replacements would be wrong to the point where it was funny to me because i thought like are they playing a joke on me is this their secret way of sending me pr like without putting me on their PR list because I'm, you know, I don't have enough followers to warrant a space, but maybe they just really like me. I don't know. But see, this is how you might think it's to Lulu, but this is how everything works in my favor because I make it work in my favor. Again, it's just that unconscious, like, good girl programming of, well, you shouldn't do that because it's manipulative. Like, don't just charm people to get more stuff. But why not, though? 
What's so bad about that? If life hands you a situation where somebody got your order wrong, whether it's an item or like at a restaurant, right? I actually, I love it more when it's at a restaurant or like some setting where you're actually interacting in real time with people. If you're at a restaurant and somehow they mess up your order, to me, that's like the best thing, one of the best things that can happen to me. Because like then I get to demonstrate what a gracious, patient, amazing person I am. I'm not going to go off on their staff. I'm not going to be like abusive to the poor waitress or waiter that's probably making minimum wage. Like for what? Why am I? I'm not upset. Everyone makes mistakes. If it was me in that job, if I made a mistake with someone's order, I would want someone to give me the same grace. And so, yeah, it's an opportunity to demonstrate what a nice, caring, empathetic person I am, patient person. And guess what happens? Usually they'll like give you extra food or say that the tab is on the house. So everything works in my favor. Yeah, this is how you do it. I mean, start with, don't discount like the small things in life. Don't just think that, oh, that doesn't really matter. No, like every little bit counts. Every mundane situation is a chance for you to practice your alchemy powers. And you keep expanding that container. You keep building up that power to the point where you're able to do it with more and more seemingly dire situations. So for example, what's an actual catastrophic type event? People actually, people structure frauds around these situations, the people that understand that you can benefit from anything in life. I wouldn't advise you to be dishonest, but I would say like, for example, if you get into a car accident, right? Or if you're walking and somebody hits you with their car or their bike. I'm not saying that you should want that to happen. I'm not saying that that's a good thing. I'm saying that sometimes these things happen in life, right? Accidents happen. If it happens to you and like you're already on the other side of it, right? You can't go back in time and take a different route and make sure that it doesn't happen. If it happens to you, let's say somebody hits you with a car and then like you break your leg, right? Horrible. So much pain, blood, rush to the hospital. But still ask yourself, what can I get out of it? Insurance money? What if you were like nice and gracious to the person that hit you by accident? What if it was an honest mistake that they couldn't see where they were going? What if you had enough empathy to realize that that person probably feels terrible and it's not going to help the situation? Like it would not be a net positive. No matter how much you're in pain, it would still not be a net positive if you decided to take it out on that person, right? If they were remorseful. Even if they weren't remorseful, you can still use it to your benefit. Let's say that, I don't know, they were crazy or they tried to do a hit and run. Be smart, obviously, like have your wits about you. I'm not, this is not me advocating for you to just like skip around and have your head in the clouds and not pay attention. No, like be shrewd, take out your phone, right? Take the opportunity to snap a picture, like whether the person is cooperative or not. If you can, snap a picture of their license plate, their identification so that the police can track them down later if they try to run away. Um, but you, you focus on how you can get the most out of the situation, right? You don't need to be concerned with what the other person is doing. I feel like this is not a good example because this didn't actually happen to me, but like similar stuff in a similar vein on a smaller scale has happened to me. Maybe I should have just gone with the real example. Okay, let's just, let's just, let's ride with the car accident example. So like, it's not going to help you if you're angry at the person, right? So think about what reaction, what conduct that you can take that is going to get you the most re rewards. So it's probably going to be, you know, if you are uh, smart enough to have like life insurance policy or something, that's a bonus, right? Because that then you're going to collect on that, the smart choice that you made earlier to enroll into life insurance. Um, if you're nice to the person, like if the person is very remorseful and you're very nice and forgiving, that person is going to be inclined to maybe also like give you some sort of monetary compensation. Even if the person is not cooperative, let's say they try to run away or they try to get out of, you know, paying whatever fine or uh, doing whatever service that the, the police or the court rules them to do, you still can benefit from being, from acting like a sane person, right? You're not letting people off the hook for doing something wrong. You are taking their beha bad behavior and using it to also 
continue to build a better case for yourself because it's only going to make you look better if if you're in any type of altercation with someone right where it ends up in the police coming right or some outer authority stepping in it only makes you look better no matter what happens so if if both parties are cooperative and respectful that's great that's the ideal situation well i mean in that situation i don't think the police would even be called right because those two people would have high enough consciousness to sort out the issue amongst themselves if one party is if the uh, opposite party is very belligerent towards you or they're being very unreasonable then that also makes you look good like the more level-headed and the more reasonable and calm you stay not only in opposition to them but also for the cops or whoever is in the vicinity to witness right like because if it's in public there's going to be even just strangers on the street they're going to be watching the interaction and they're going to right away make the judgment that oh you're the sane rational person you're probably the victim in this because this crazy person is coming at you seemingly completely unprovoked because you're not giving them anything to give them a reason to be so aggressive and yet they're just like acting crazy so let crazy be crazy or no let crazy look crazy yeah that's the term the crazier they look, the better you look, the more angelic you are, the more of a saint you are. Uh, do you see how there's nothing wrong in that whatsoever? Like, that's the alchemy mindset. You can even, okay, let's let's get even more, more controversial. Um, S.A. I'm not going to say the entire phrase because YouTube is going to demonetize. It probably is already demonetizing because I feel like they just, the algorithm, you know, it's getting smarter. But um, S.A., which I myself went through when I was very young, like not, yeah, early 20s. Um, again, I am not saying that you should be wish this on anyone or that anyone should do this. This is not like a justification for predators out there that do this. I'm just saying that sometimes if you find yourself a victim of this unfortunate situation, which I did when I was younger, you can use that to your advantage too. If you feel the conviction to do so, you can pursue legal action against this person, right? You can me to them. Of course, you would have to, that would come at the sacrifice of your own privacy, probably, uh, which is the reason why a lot of victims don't speak out because they don't, uh, they would rather have it just forget about it than to, you know, drag it out in possibly, possibly in public. And like, nobody wants their, even though, but some people do, right? Some people find the pursuit of justice against the criminal to be worth the mental stress that they would have to bear from having you know having the story aired to the public but um yeah whichever way you decide to deal with it though you can still benefit from it if somebody did that to you no one is denying that you were wronged but instead of leaving it there like you're a victim and you are violated and helpless at the hands of this person why don't you take back the power by going on to live your best life anyway easier said than done i know but that's also a part of everything works out in my favor, you know? It's not to say that, like, anyone should want to experience SA or want to be a victim of, you know, a predator. But if it happens to you, which unfortunately it does happen to people all the time, use it. Like, I'm doing it right now. I'm using this story to help illustrate for you how you can take some, even the most darkest, like, some of the most darkest and disempowered situations that you can be in especially as a woman and still use it to your advantage okay like in my case yeah that happened to me um and it wasn't right and the person who did it to me was in the fault 100 percent. but that does not mean that i'm gonna live the rest of my life feeling shame or trying to hide my sexuality right hide that part of myself because um, I do like to express that part of myself, right? I like to dress in a way that emphasizes my curves. I like to do pole dancing because it's it makes me feel like very sensual and it puts me in touch with my feminine side. And it's also a lot of fun, like much more than just regular exercise. This is why I could never work out consistently in a gym like some people do. I admire people who have that discipline, but the only way that you can get me to work out is if is if I can get personal satisfaction from it in watching myself in a playback video wearing a really nice sexy outfit and heels and I'm gonna enjoy it like 10 times more now. 
10 times more than I would have if the essay didn't happen to me, if that makes sense. So that's how I alchemize that experience. Yeah, because once again, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I just feel so frustrated sometimes when I see, like, I understand the pain. I understand the pain and also the weird social conditioning that, you know, as a woman, it's this whole thing about women having to be perfect victims in order to get any sympathy, right? Um, so if you were essayed, you'll get sympathy as long as you act like this pure, perfect version that, oh, I would never even think about uh, SCX. Like, you know, I always dress modestly. I would never do like, no. Even if we are talking about an OnlyFans girl that does X work on the internet as her job, if somebody violated her, that's still just as much of a crime as if it was done to like a sheltered girl from you know, a Catholic family that is a virgin. But society likes to shame women this way, right? So don't accept it, you know? Because that is, that may be what be, that may be what is holding you back from fully alchemizing that type of experience if it happened to you. So that's why I'm very open and unabashed about like my style. I like to look sexy. I like to do pole dance. I also like the Douyin cute style sometimes, you know? Like, well, Douyin is pretty sexy too. But like, you know, I have different flavors. Sometimes I want to be sexy. Sometimes I want to be like just carefree, innocent. Uh, sometimes I want to be like the boss babe, businesswoman. And I can be all of those things. Like, I don't need to water down the sex kitten persona just because something someone did that to me actually i'm gonna turn it up even more now like i'm gonna get even more pleasure from that sexual side of me because i get to experience that right not the person who did that to me so once you get comfortable to the point where you're able to do this with mundane like everyday happenings in your life when you catch yourself defaulting to the negative or the triggered reaction just stop yourself right Flip it, flip the old story that you used to tell on its head and figure out what you can get from the situation. When you do that long enough, it's going to build the foundation. It's going to solidify the new programming. It's going to be, you know, kind of hard, kind of tedious in the beginning, right? But after you do it for a while, you will get to a point where you can switch to maintenance mode so that your, your set point is going to change. So instead of defaulting to a negative or triggered reaction, you're going to realize at some point you will start to default into this type of positive alchemist reaction, if you will. That's where I am right now. I gotta tell you, like, it's a really fun place to be. It's really nice over here. You just, you train your brain to see opportunity everywhere, right? Like, you're an opportunist. And yeah, I don't care. People think that that's, that word is bad. No, it's not bad. It depends on the situation, right? If you're an opportunist with pure intentions, like just trying to better your life, using yourself as an example to inspire others, how is that a bad thing, right? Now, if you're an opportunist and you're like taking care, taking advantage of minors or, um, you know, exploiting children for cheap labor or something, obviously that would be a bad example. But the ethical implications lie in the situation themselves, not the concept of being an opportunist. You can use anything any tendency or any uh, tool for good or bad in your life. Even when I hear just regular random news stories, I my alchemist gears are always turning. I remember a while back there was this Japanese like cabinet member, politician, someone who got into a bit of hot water because he was saying that, I don't know if it's the same person, but yeah, there were, there were a couple of remarks like, number one, you know, women are just baby making machines. And then like number two, women should always wear heels and makeup. According to this politician, that is the baseline expectation that women should adhere to in the workplace. And of course, like people are outraged, calling him a misogynist, calling for him to be removed for his, from his post. I don't know if he ever was. I doubt it. My thing is why waste your anger on this sad little old man who clearly has a fetish for heels? You gotta give these idiots grace sometimes, you know? Like they don't know how to express themselves as eloquently as we do. So... Like him saying that women belong in a tight skirt and heels at all times, that's his way of saying that this is what turns me on because, you know, I probably can't get it up anymore. Probably like I'm estranged from my wife and I don't have any feminine essence in my life. This is his way, the only way that he knows how, okay, to say that he is desperate for like feminine energy in his life. So why don't you go put on some heels and a tight dress around this gross, old, sad, pathetic politician that has a ton of money? Uh, why don't you put on some heels and go finesse him out of his money? You see? 
what is there to be mad about? I don't see any benefits from getting mad. I see an opportunity to get a bag, you know? If I was the women working with him, I would be like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, my heel broke. Oh my god, I don't have an extra pair with me here and... <laughs> The only store that's nearby is a Christian Louboutin and oh my god, I'm just like so embarrassed because I just, I can't, like I'm a woman, you know, and I can't be seen in public without heels on. It's just not ladylike. What am I gonna do? Like, I and I can't afford those heels, but oh my god, like, don't you see those red bottoms? They go so well with this tight skirt that I have and then... Oh, would you look at that? It's lunchtime. Do you mind like helping me? Do you mind just, can we just go into that store for one minute? Like I know um, maybe I can find some flats, you know, that I can afford. There's your new pair of Louboutin heels. You're welcome. Like get a bag, okay? <laughs> Don't get angry over things that are not going to make you money. Like this is the mindset that you need to have. It's so funny because people, the bulk of this work, in case you haven't noticed, is energetic it happens in your own mind right so it's funny because sometimes when people see me deploying these techniques like out in the field out in real life they take it to me like for example if i am just i don't know buying something in a store and the shopkeeper is rude to me in return do i get rude back do i get triggered no i just get like even more polite but like genuine okay not in a passive aggressive way like genuinely polite why because i'm not the kind of person that needs to take my own anger issues out on an innocent customer or a stranger right i'm not that kind of person so this cashier or whoever that was rude to me thank you for being rude because now you're just giving me a chance to highlight even more how much i'm not like you right like how how much better i am than you so that's the way that I alchemize that situation. But it's funny because people who are not familiar with this type of conscious manifestation, like turning everything to work in my, in my favor, I'll have friends, acquaintances who witness that type of stuff and they tell me, oh my God, you are too nice. Like, why are you so nice? You know, that person deserved to be cursed out, blah, blah, blah. Be very clear. I'm not saying to be a doormat, okay? There's a fine line between being a doormat and being so savage that you turn literally any situation even someone giving you a dirty look even someone being mean to you for no reason into more gold more energy more reinforcement for yourself and that fine line cannot be seen with your physical two eyes which is why it's just ironic to me because people who are not familiar with what's going, what I'm doing energetically, they take it at surface level as, oh my God, she's letting people walk all over her. No, it's the opposite. I'm being more savage than you could ever know. I'm literally taking this situation, right? Anytime somebody is unpleasant to me, I take it as they decided to do that. So I don't hesitate to go in for the kill and take the situation and transmute it into an opportunity to build myself up to further reinforce how good of a person I am to say and this is also oh my god so there was a girl that made a comment I think it was a girl yeah she made a comment about on my one of my community posts asking me if I had any suggestions for how to overcome bullying or how to deal with bullies and I was gonna make this a separate live but I guess I'm on a roll here so um I want you to get to the level where words such as bullying or peer pressure, like anything that is coming from a place of victim mentality, coming from a place of like, people are doing this to me, people are forcing. I want you to think of bullying and peer pressure, those types of words, as what I like to call a playground concept, okay? This is something that elementary school kids, like preschool kids, deal with in the sandbox. You know, a little boy is trying to build a sandcastle and the big tall bully who's like twice his size comes up and knocks it down he makes the other little boy cry that's bullying right because that's as a child um that's a situation that you you're not equipped to deal with yet you need parents you need teachers to uh teach you how to respond and unfortunately most people don't understand how to properly teach children to respond to that effectively okay so by the time you become an adult bullying should not be like it should not be a state 
that you could ever inhabit. Let's replace the word bully with peer pressure because I think bullying is a playground concept, right? This is what people, kids in elementary school deal with. Peer pressure is more like, okay, young adult, right? Like we hear about peer pressure in high school uh, to do drugs or to engage in extracurricular activities, we'll say. You know what that's code for, etc. So that's like peer pressure. So I will say that peer pressure is like a middle school slash high school concept. Both are minors, right? High school, middle school, and elementary school. By the time you become an adult, you should no longer need those protective categories for, you know, ways that people try to victimize you. If somebody tries to peer pressure you, it should not register in your mind as anything except this person is a little cuckoo. Like if someone tries to give you a backhand compliment or like, I don't know, say something slick about your haircut, right? You should either A, just like take it as a compliment. What would be a good backhand compliment? Like, oh, your hair looks so nice. Did you color it? Did you finally color it? Something like that, right? Like um, implying that it looked dull before and if it looks good, then it must be artificial. Okay, that's not a good example, but we'll roll with it. So if you are in an empowered state of mind, if you're not being a victim, it doesn't make sense. There's no way for you to register that as anything other than a compliment, right? So just take it at face value, just say thank you. But if you feel like they're being, you know, catty or something, then just let them expose themselves as crazy, right? So you thank them wholeheartedly, like, oh my god, thank you so much, you're so nice, not in a passive-aggressive way, that's going to throw them off. They're not going to know what to do from there. First of all, they're going to be like, wait a minute, I didn't mean to actually compliment you. I meant to, you know, cut you down and uh, take you down a few notches and see you squirm. But you didn't give them what, you, what they wanted, right? You just gave them a very gracious thank you, gratitude for their compliment. And so they're going to be stuck at that point because if they reveal that they actually meant to diss you, then they're revealing all their cards. So they're not going to do that, right? But that means that the only option left for them is to play along with you and say, oh yeah, you're welcome and pretend that uh, they meant it. But then they're going to be fuming on the inside because they'll realize that it went over your head. So the insult that they tried to launch at you, it didn't land. And there's no way for them to force the landing without giving themselves away. So sit back and watch them implode and enjoy the show. <laughs> and yeah, just in general, anytime anyone is trying to like approach you, um, see, I don't, I feel so, like I've, I don't even, I don't think of myself as a person who can be bullied. So, okay, the only, the adult version of bullying, do you know what the legitimate version of bullying is in my world anything that is an actual physical assault on your body right so if somebody uh punches you or even if they like grab your arm that's a violation of your physical boundaries right that is a situation where you call the cops okay so when you're past the elementary school past the middle school high school stage when you come across Anything that, any words that people say to you, like words, looks of content, those things do not land on you. If anything, you should act confused. Even if someone is saying something blatantly disrespectful or like blatantly trying to pressure you into doing something. Okay, I would say pressure, pressure is a legitimate thing that even adults do, deal with, right? Bullying and peer pressure, I don't, I don't really buy that. You should act confused. You should, like, you're not bully a bull is a good way to put it, right? It's kind of like, um, I love this one scene in Mulan where Shan Ying Yu, right, the, the warrior king guy, uh, gets to the emperor and then he's yelling at the emperor to bow down to him, right? And then the emperor delivers one of the most epic one-liners ever uttered in film history, whether animated or live action. He says, the mountain cannot bow down no matter how the wind howls. Bow to me! No matter how the wind howls. The mountain cannot bow to it. You are the emperor, okay? So someone could be waving a sword in your face or like calling you all types of names, calling you your dog, your cat, derogatory names. They could be giving you condescending up and down stairs. As long as they're not touching your physical body, that's not like you're not in danger, right? And so you're only concerned about if somebody is actually physically assaulting you because then that's assault, 
right? And you can call the cops on them if they assault you. But if it's words, this is called a crazy person, like a crazy unhinged person, probably lonely, probably sad, um, can't get a man. She's probably like upset about herself. So maybe this is like, she doesn't have enough vocabulary or eloquence to express herself differently than to say like, these crazy things about you that you don't even know where she got that from. So that would be my advice on how to deal with bullying. Just like act confused. Act confused. Um, pretend you didn't hear them. Just like change the subject. Don't even like respond. Just like talk about something else. Or just like walk away. Or pretend that someone called you. Like oh oh my god I see like my sister's outside to pick me up. Okay bye. It was so nice talking to you. And also as you walk away from this crazy person that is like just saying random shit to you you can be like wow i am so glad that i am not crazy like that i would never go up to someone and just start spewing random things that don't make sense like i don't really i don't even understand what language she's speaking is it english thank you god that i'm not like that that i'm better than that so that's how you deal with bullies because like you can't you can't be bullied if <laughs> if you're not bullyable, if you don't, only if you react does it make their advances true, you know? So react in a way that builds you up only. Yeah, so I wrote bullying is a playground concept. So the only scenarios that I consider actual, you know, threatening your physical safety is if someone is physically harming you, like punching you or pulling you, pulling your hair or something like that if somebody is holding you captive in a place against your will, right? That's also a crime. So these are crimes that are punishable by law. And then also if someone is verbally threatening you to do either of the above, that's also something that can be rectified by law. Anything else, anything that falls out of those categories is just a crazy person being silly, okay? Like a sad person. They don't have anyone in their lives. They don't know how to express themselves in an emotionally intelligent way. So they need to resort to like cheap insults, things like that, which has nothing to do with you and how amazing of a person you are, right? In fact, it just reinforces how much better you are than them. So be happy when people try to bully or cut you down because it just proves so clearly, clear as day, how much better you are than them. And don't feel bad about being better than people because you can't help it. That's another thing. Like, you don't need to feel guilty that you're better than people because you are like, you know, you're not gonna, you're not like discriminating against people, but you are, you happen to be better than some people in terms of your thought process and your like your empathy, the way that you treat other people, right? You would never go up to someone and try to pressure them to something, to do something they don't want to do or to um, break their boundaries for you. So every person that tries to do that to you, you can take that as like extra confirmation from the universe, like extra reinforcement of how amazing you are. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I have a real life example of this as well. So even for me, and like, I don't even consider this anything, a blip on my radar even, but hearing some of my other friends or like people, other people on YouTube talking about this, I realized that maybe this is actually like an issue that other people struggle with emotion like they give a lot of emotional investment and energy away regarding this issue but to me it's not even an issue so um i had like a mini party phase i feel like this summer i don't know what that was all about like uh yeah i had a friend that was inviting me to like all sorts of parties and going to the beach this summer for some reason and you know i'm happy like it's nice to feel wanted in places but you know these parties usually happened at nightclubs and like uh sky pools things like that where a lot of alcohol is present right and i would find myself in um i i like to stay out as late as possible until the last train so it would usually be like you know at night and people are obviously the, the alcohol is flowing and it's kind of like unheard of to not drink if you're gonna go out and party and go to places like that clubs and whatnot but i don't drink because i don't like the way it makes me feel so i always just get a soft drink like my Two classics of choice, jasmine tea and ginger ale. That's what I sip on all night long because I don't need alcohol. I get high on life. Also, like I, I legitimately get heart palpitations. I don't know if it's an allergy or if it's just because I never... Because I feel like other people, like everyone turns red, right? Everyone has a point where they 
go overboard but other people I feel like build up their tolerance and I just never had the desire to build up any tolerance to alcohol because I don't I never enjoyed it so yeah I, I can't handle any alcohol really and I don't like the way it makes me feel and I don't care about the taste either so I would much rather drink soft drinks and I would have people at these parties whether daytime or nighttime like constantly offering me drinks alcoholic beverages constantly pushing it in my face like sometimes actually you know pushing it in my face like holding the shot glass out not letting up until I took it uh did I take that as bullying or peer pressure though not at all not at all because I know that I don't drink like that's just that's not up for discussion you know like that's my own decision for myself that is not something that anybody could ever anyone outside of me could ever influence and so I was very unbothered sometimes people would literally like try to push a drink in my hand i would take it and then i would just like pour it out in a plant or something while they were not looking but i realized that maybe like there were some videos recommended to me on youtube about oh um you know my summer being sober or like how i decided to get sober or you know how how do i not give into the pressure of social drinking stuff like that and these are from adults these are not like 21 year olds these are from people in their 30s and 40s talking about how difficult it was to navigate having a social life, but also not wanting to drink alcohol. And I found it so strange that they would even consider something like that to be something to stress over. Like someone shoving an alcoholic beverage in your face, even though you've said over and over again that you don't drink alcohol. That's not my problem, right? That this person can't get a clue. So the most I've ever thought is just like, wow, this, they must be really drunk to like not because they clearly didn't hear me the last five times that I said no. Does it affect me at all? Like in here? So you need to also, um, if you want to get down to the technical aspects of how to do this, you need to like, you know what your triggers are, right? So if you find yourself in a stressful situation, let's say it's the alcohol thing. For me, like I actually never felt pressure whatsoever because I've always known that I'm just not into alcohol like that. I don't like the taste, right? So why would I drink something that doesn't taste good to me? It's just non-logical to me. The very basic logic of I don't drink things that don't taste good to me overrides like whatever silly things people are trying to do to pressure me to drink. It doesn't register in my mind. I hope that makes sense. But let's say that for you, it's a big anxiety point, right? Like if somebody offers you a drink or if you see someone just coming at you with a beer in their hand, you can feel your stress and anxiety levels rising. I want you to really take notice of that and actually go into your body. Learn how to soothe that feeling. Learn how to bring it down, right? Because usually, like for me, when I feel anxiety, it gathers in this area, right? Like the shoulders and like the chest and it, keep, it moves up towards my face, up my neck. That's how I experience anxiety. Um, and it could be, you know, it's different depending on what the trigger is, but for the most part, that's how I, I experience it. Like if I, right now, I can, I can call upon that feeling right now if I think about tomorrow or like today, I have to, like all the work that I have to do, the deadlines I have to meet. Once I notice that that's what's happening physically, I will stop what I'm doing, like physically stop and do either deep breath work, you know, like breathe in, count to eight, hold it for eight counts, breathe out, or you can do, um, I forgot what it's called, like E something tapping, EMDR. So wherever the, um, I'm not, I'm not like a professional. So if you're interested, if you really want to delve into these techniques, which I suggest you do, um, I, cause I know it's like, it's counterintuitive because a lot of people, they think that all of this is a mental game, right? I mean, it is about your mental strength and clarity, but it's also, it's all connected. You know, the signals that your body give you are very important. And sometimes it's the last place that you think of but if you can like focus on techniques to bring down that physical manifestation of anxiety in your body that's going to help you out a lot because once the when the physical feeling is gone then it's very easy to let like your logical brain take over and recognize this person in front of you trying to pressure you as just a silly person right instead of something that actually has like power over you or someone who has the ability to make you do something that you don't want to do when you take a when you use like emdr tapping or deep breathing to um dissipate that feeling in your body then you're just left with like your mature 
adult logical thoughts that, wait a minute, that makes no sense. Nobody can make me do what I don't want to do because I'm a full grown adult that has sovereignty over my own body and mind. Again, unless you are in one of two situations, someone is physically assaulting you or phys physically holding you captive in a place like chained up in someone's basement. Those are genuine situations where you need to call upon law enforcement to put this person in jail. I want to try one of these. I will try one before I go to sleep. Mmm. Mmm, it's good. It has like a crunchy center. 